All right, please put your hands together and welcome Anne Lim O'Brien and our last group of panelists. What we should do, all of us, is to just stand up and do a wave. Because I think that we probably need the energy to just be elevated just a little bit. Have your stretch. Say hello to someone. There we go. Okay, there you go. I knew I knew everybody wanted to do something. That's right. That's the risk. Now I have to get everybody attention. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final panel at the a ABR Summit. It really is a privilege to be here and a pleasure, really, to experience some of the amazing talent that I've met this afternoon. Our panel is, as you know, on leadership evolution. They will discuss, or we will discuss, how we further Asian American talent and ensure equitable access to the C-suite positions. I'm Anne Lim O'Brien, and my firm is Hydric and Struggles. We're deeply committed to diversity and inclusion efforts, especially as we help shape leadership teams across the globe and here in the US. Um, this is a passion topic for me, and she heard me last night. And I'm excited to have a panel who are equally, um, not only distinguished and highly qualified to share their perspectives and experiences and encouragement, but they are also, I think, generationally speaking, if I dare say this, I think they're probably at least 10 years younger than I am, so I'm really pleased uh, to be with the younger folks. It always makes me feel good uh, and more relevant. Um, having spent some time together in the last week, and I trust that you've read the bios, I actually would love for them to provide some color on their own heritage and their own fun fact about why they're here, why they feel passionately, as passionately about this. Um, and I'd love to start with Kim at, at the end there um, and to share a little bit about himself with us. All right, hi guys. So my name is Kim Lee. I am the Chief Financial Officer of Global Atlantic. We are a life insurance company. Um, just by way of background, uh, I was born in Canada. Uh, my background is Chinese. Uh, I moved to Hong Kong with my parents uh, in the 80s. That's the reverse direction of where everybody was going. Everybody was going from Hong Kong to Canada at the time. Uh, I uh, stayed there for eight years, uh, went to school in the United States. I started my career at Goldman Sachs in 2001. Uh, I'm not sure this is a fun fact, but I, my first day of work was September 10th, 2001, so I've seen a lot in my career. Uh, we, uh, I started investment banking, and uh, one of the, like my, the most pivotal decision in my career uh, starting out was joining a group, building a business. So we built a business, it was called the reinsurance business at uh, Goldman Sachs. We ultimately sold it to private investors in 2013, so Global Atlantic is a privately held life insurance company, over $80 billion of assets. Uh, I've been the CFO for over seven years. Uh, in terms of fun facts, I live in a household with uh, only women, uh, I have three daughters, uh, uh, Charlotte, who's seven, Francis, who's four, and Lenny, and Madeline, who is two. Uh, in my household, I am the plus one in the family. My wife has a much bigger public profile than I do. She's running for office. Uh, uh, she's running for state assembly in lower Manhattan, which includes both Chinatown as well as the Lower East Side, uh, and the financial district for all those who work in the financial district. Um, so uh, just seeing her uh, do something that's different from what's really, it, 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 when I think about what I'm good at, uh, when I think about uh, the things I would be afraid of doing, running for office is pretty much the top of the list of things <laughs> I'd be afraid of doing. Just watching her just inspires me to uh, really to uh, do this kind of work. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Lee. Uh, I work for a software company called SAP. Um, as a chief operating officer for our procurement and external labor management uh, part of the business. Um, you know, I've, in my career, I've pretty much been in the enterprise software space uh, since the beginning. Uh, in terms of heritage, I was born in Hawaii, so for any of you who are wondering what my middle name Kalani stands for, that's Hawaiian. Um, 
so I, I lived there for the first seven years of my life, then moved back to Taiwan, where my family's from, and lived there for eight years. Um, then, you know, just like Kim, spent some time in Canada, the parts of my schooling. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate throughout my life to live and work in different places. You know, I've spent quite a bit of time in Europe in my career, um, time in, uh, you know, Singapore, China, Japan, and then back in uh, US since a couple of years now. A uh, little fun fact about myself is, um, you know, a big passion of mine outside of business is music, particularly classical music. Um, I trained for many years as a uh, classical pianist. Um, maybe perhaps in a parallel universe, I could have become a full-time musician. Who knows? Uh, but in these days, I spent most of my time when I play. Um, I've gotten really good at Disney tunes because I play for my two kids. <laughs> Um, I have a five-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son, and I can tell you I know every single song from Frozen 1 <laughs> and, and Frozen 2, so I'm really proud of that. <laughs> Always have a backup plan. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having us um, on stage today, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Karen Fang, and uh, I run Global Cross Asset Trading at Bank America. And I can explain to you if that doesn't sound uh, straightforward, but basically that means across all the different products that we offer in global fixed income currencies and commodities um, around the trading business, which makes me one of the, well, makes me the only woman on the global trading management team, which I think I do think we have a lot of work to do in sales and trading investment banks. Um, but very uh, quickly, my, bab my background, um, is that I was born in mainland China. I was born in a city called Suzhou, which is very close to Shanghai. Um, I was born and raised there until I was 17 years old. I went to Japan. I got into University of Tokyo after you know, having studied Japanese for two months and had to take the college entrance exam. As I, as I now say, that's probably the only cool thing I've ever done in my life and haven't really been able to top that, learn Japanese in two months, so that was pretty cool. Um, so uh, life since then has been sort of, you know, going to University of Tokyo, graduating, um, started with Merrill Lynch in Tokyo, moved to London for a few years, then moved to the States for, uh, I think, in 2002, so 17 years ago. That definitely makes me a qualified New Yorker. Um, I also have a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter and four-and-a-half-year-old son. She's obsessed with Let It Go. Frozen, so definitely have to invite you over to my house for dinner. Um, so the um, I was actually doing a lot of structuring. I started in derivative trading and moving to sales and structuring and kind of moved back to trading and uh, do all kinds of different things. I'm very passionate about my job, but also very passionate about DNI. I'm on the Asian American, uh, sorry, I'm on the Asian Enterprise Council for Bank America. I'm on the Global ESG Committee, so you can, you can tell my passion there, in addition to my job and my family. So again, thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm Sharda Sharu. I'm so glad to be here. And Anne, I think you and I are of the same generation. I, oh. uh, I, I'm quite <laughs> sure we are. Um, I uh, grew up in India. I grew up in India and um, arranged marriage at the age of 17, and we've been married 43 years now, so you, you know, simple math. Me too, simple <laughs> math. Um, and, um, and I've been here, uh, mo moved to uh, the U.S. at 18. I think my, um, my mother was pretty wise. I think what she felt is, was a pretty good student, did pretty well in school and stuff. So she probably figured it'd be very strategic for me to get married, because she wasn't gonna send me here as a single person back, uh, you know, in, I came here in 77. And, um, so, um, so I got married um, uh, there, and you know we knew each other's families, and you know we've been uh, married since. I have a wonderful husband. I was telling someone a, a, a few stories about him, about he's sort of how he's been probably one of those um, silent mentors, sponsors behind the scenes that has probably made me what I am today. Uh, I never tell that to him <laughs> right when he's in the room because, I don't know, for whatever reason. Um, so I, I joined Ernst & Young in 82, so I've been there 37 years. I've been a partner for about 28 years in the firm. I was, you know, the first woman partner in their Stanford office. I think I was the first woman of Indian origin in the big eight firms back 
when I made Partner 28 plus years ago. And, um, you know, it's what's been very interesting, um, you know, fun fact, I can't think of too many. I, um, you know, don't have children, uh, so I, I don't understand any of this frozen stuff uh, at all. I have no idea what you're talking about. But, but, but I, you know, I, I think one of the fun facts really was is when I first came uh, to the U.S., um, I was, you know, I landed at JFK. There were cars, like, going at 60 miles per hour. I'd never seen that sort of speed in my life growing up in Calcutta, India. And the first thing that came to my mind was I'll never be able to drive in this country, never. Right, I just thought I'd die on, on, on a highway, right? It was just sort of this mortal fear and scare, you know, just really honestly scared. And you think about it, if you land in Connecticut and if you cannot drive, <laughs> you can't do anything, you're done, right? You're absolutely done. And so the first year um, was spent um, uh, just working in a grocery store. I think that is my, um, there was a Gristides that was walking distance from our apartment, so that was my first job. But the fun fact was, you know, my, my regular, I think the minimum wage back then was $1.87 an hour. And um, so I was sweeping the floors and someone walked over to me and asked me, uh, like, where is the bounty? Right, and I'm like, what is she? And I just sort of landed from India a few months ago, right? No, con no context, no context at all. I had no idea what Charmin was, what Bounty was. I'd never seen any of this stuff before, so so it was it was quite a learning experience. So my my thing was, you know, I'm going to start studying these weekly flyers now. There was no internet, there was nothing, right? So I I was like, what are the prices? And I oh, I wondered about things like. Why is a nickel larger than a dime, and it's twice the, you know, it's half the, uh, you know, half the, whatever the back thing was. So I, you know, you know, I think what what the biggest thing that I realize over time uh, is how important it is to have context, how important it is to sort of have that. I almost felt like I was like a child growing up, not knowing what the currency looked like, not knowing the brands speaking English, English, but not really understanding what people said, right? And so that whole learning, I mean, I, we ate with hands in India. You know, we, we washed our hands regularly, and you ate with your hands, right? So what, what mortally scared me is my interview with um, you know, the various people once I you know, got out of college uh, was, I'm going to go to lunch, and there's going to be a spoon and a fork. What am I going to order? Because if there's a lot of spoon and fork to be had, I mean, I, I'd learned, but I wasn't quite adept at it in a few years, right? So I used to order sandwiches, probably easier to eat because you can eat a sandwich with a hand, you don't have to cut, you know, use a knife and fork on it. But it, it's, you know, it's those things that you don't even think about. And if you think about the journeys that we've all gone through over our lives, where we, where we haven't had that sort of luxury of context and where we've come a, a long way, you know, I, I just feel, you know, we all should sort of really think about, about what we've, where we've all been and feel hugely proud hugely proud of what we've all done. So, you know, I, I, um, that's sort of where my mind's at. Sharda, thank you. I wanted to do this because there is a very poignant aspect of our topic, elevating Asian American talent. We all came from somewhere, which is modest and very, very likely. And even if it wasn't modest, we all had to go through a certain learning. I know I was born and raised in Singapore. I've been here for 35 years. When I first came, I thought, gee, I, got, I spoke the Queen's English. Nobody understood me because I was speaking three times as fast as I'm speaking right now. So we all have, we all came from somewhere into, especially New York, but into this country. So the elevating of Asian American talent is really interesting. And I wanted to be sure you had a baseline on each of our panelists. Um, and Kim, I'm, I live with three boys, including my husband. And I have, and I have a, a husband who is a full-time father, and for our generation, that was pretty bold. Um, but then, you know, he says, go out there, bring home the bacon, and I married an American, what can I say? So <laughs> I hated that, that term, bring home the bacon. So let's jump right into the, the, the topic of the topic, which is, you know, from each of your perspectives, I think ESG has really elevated the conversation on DNI to a degree that is really critical today in corporations. And we have to build, you know, we have to break the stereotypes. 
we have to break uh, into the thinking that is going to help us lay out this pipeline. So for each of us, I would love to hear your point of view on what are the challenges that you think are facing organizations today that are maybe the biggest and the toughest to fix? What are they and how do we do that? How do we fix it? Karen, would you like to start, uh, start us off? Yeah, she already gave me the mic, so I guess <laughs> I'm starting. Um, so I think there are a couple of things um, that really presents real challenges. The first thing is awareness. So we didn't actually set up, um, I think I have some colleagues here from the bank that, that was, you know, that, that runs our Asian Leadership Network. It's kind of more of a grassroots and bottoms up organization has been within the bank for a long time. But if you think about the awareness from the top, and it's at the board level and the C-suite level and sometimes very senior clients, they're not aware that there is a problem about the representation of senior Asians in the very, very top of the organization. So I think that awareness is definitely lacking. We didn't set up our enterprise level Asian Leadership Council until a year ago, which, which I'm now part of, and that's a cross-divisional council that's sponsored by C-suite members. So that, that awareness has finally bubbled up, you know, thanks to the Asian Leadership, leadership, leadership Network's job, uh, work, and a lot of, you know, team members' work. That awareness has now been, you know, achieved. And now we have a solution, which is, okay, we're gonna have a C-suite sponsored enterprise level council. We're gonna drive metrics. And it sounds boring, but I think to us Asians, I think the numbers are really good because now you can actually measure progress. You can make it very tangible, very measurable. So that's one. Two is I think, you know, I don't have to make the distinction between mentorship and sponsorship anymore because I think that concept has been well understood. But again, the top-down sponsorship of someone who is very senior, who has the reach in the organization, the capacity to make things happen, for that person or for that group of people to sponsor emerging talent, emerging leaders, and actually making their, that their own, you know, sort of part of their mandate and part of their goal to really make this happen, increase that penetration at the C-suite of Asian Americans and Asian, you know, Americans or Asian leaders in general, and to really make that ratio go higher. I mean, we see a lot of drop after, you know, in typical investment banks, analysts and associates, vice president, directors, managing director, you have a lot of entry level representation, maybe to the vice president level, but it really drops off at director and managing director level. And you look at functions, the functions that's quantitative risk-based or quants-based, filled with Asians. But when you look at investment banking and sales and trading and you know other client-facing frontline jobs, that again, that representation ratio comes down. So I think that's where we have to be honest, intellectually honest about the issue, be aware of the issue, do something about it, and really making very senior members of the organization very accountable for driving metrics and making measurable progresses. Otherwise, it's just all talk. So I think those are things that I, I, I have observed. Maybe I'll just carry on from that. Uh, Karen, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, in, in my opinion, the, the biggest challenge that we face is that the, the pace of, in, we're stifling innovation because we are not fully embracing diversity. In my opinion, diversity isn't a nice to have, but it's necessary to move the business forward. You know, as Asian Americans, as a group, just like every other group, we come with our distinct background, way of thinking, and we come up with a lot of different new ideas that are different from you know, what some of the other groups would come with. And to not have that voice at the executive suite, I think is quite damaging in terms of just how much innovation and new ideas that you can get, right? So I think, it's, you know, you, you were talking a little bit about the statistics in the banking world, you know, in the tech world, we have a disproportionately high percentage of Asian Americans in entry level, you know, mid level jobs, especially when it has to do with, you know, product development, engineering. But when you look across senior uh, management, executive management, there's a disproportionately low percentage of Asian Americans being presented there. You know, that's a, it's a bit of an enigma, in my opinion, because I absolutely think in the tech space, 
you know, of all the industries, the Asian Americans will have a lot to contribute. So I, I think that's certainly one of the challenges. Uh, the second challenge that I see, um, I, I feel that the, the definition of leadership or you know, what it takes to get to the C-suite is rather narrowly defined in the North American context. Um, you know, there, there are certain traits, you know, characteristics that I'm sure we'll get into later on. They're very North America centric. And, you know, as I've had the opportunity to work and live in other parts of the world, you know, leadership styles really differ from one region to another. There isn't one that dominates, right? And to, you know, you know to, to promote Asian Americans into the C-suite and to give them more opportunities, I think we need to start by revisiting how we define leadership, right? And what are the criteria that go into it and what is the process that we take to evaluate leadership? It's not meant to, it's not an easy problem for us to solve, right? If, if it were an easy problem, we would have already solved it. So when I, let me give you an example. When I, uh, I, I do a lot of hiring of senior finance executives at, at my company, and I ask for diverse slates, you know, from the recruiter, whether it's internal or Hydrix or somebody external, it's a struggle to even get women in the mix, let alone any people of color. Uh, so it, you can't just solve this by making sure you, you know, get diverse slates and hire, uh, hire diverse candidates. That's a, poor, uh, that's a part of it. The other part is you need to develop these candidates yourself. If the slate doesn't exist, you have to go one level down or two levels down. Uh, if, you can, like, if, if the entry levels are full of Asians, women, people of color, uh, if they're all in accounting or uh, or quant, like it's the job of the corporation to move them around, move them sideways, and move them up, and that's where the sponsorship comes in, right? So you, you want that your you you want to work with your company, your HR, your leaders to promote this, not for just this next promotion round, because you know what you're going to choose with whatever available candidate is this round. You need to think two, three, or four rounds ahead, and then we're all leaders in some fashion at our companies. That's why that's why we're here. We should, bring, we should bring people with us. And don't bring one person. If you bring one person, all you're doing is keeping your ratio the same. You need to bring at least two, and then you need to teach the people you're sponsoring to bring people with them. That's, that's the only way we can lift you know, ourselves up as a group together. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think, Kim, that's a huge point. I think one of the things, I mean, there's lots of things that companies are doing. I mean, they've been, we've been on this journey for decades, right? And, and the needle hasn't moved. I mean, on the board side, mm -hmm. right? The Asian Absolutely. numbers on independent board numbers, what is it, 3%? The Asian numbers are up from our own um, mm -hmm. survey mm -hmm. for all the new board directors of 8%. Or for the uh, new ones, for the average. Yeah, it but the total is- from, yeah. I think it was like 3.5%. 3.5%, right. So, I mean, but, but the average is still Absolutely. around four, right? And with the Asian population being about 6% of the US. So it's, it's huge. But, but this thing about that, I think what you, what you just said, Kim, is we have to figure out a, a, a better way to pull each other along. And, and we don't have to wait till you know, 37 years of the firm, right? We in our each, whether you're one year in the firm, two years in the firm, three years, we have more power than we think to pull people along, to recommend people, to get people hired, Obviously, you have to be qualified, but that's the baseline, right? You ha we have to give people more of a chance. And I mean, I, you know, it's a journey that never ends, but I'll tell you, m much of my time um, is spent in re literally using my platform to try and connect people with con people. I mean, I know a lot of people around at EY, outside, and, and, I, and just getting people connected and being, getting them at the spot and giving them the chance, and then obviously it's theirs. But the one thing that, um, I mean, I, I'll tell you this story, and this is a story about my husband again, but it's very interesting because it takes a fair amount of courage. It's not very easy to feel like you belong all the time, right? Because there is, there are differences. There are things you think differently, whether it's you're a man, woman, different place. There's all kinds of dynamics, right? This was probably about 15 or so years ago, right? Um, uh, we, had, we had a new managing partner um, that was brought in from Minneapolis, Jim Turley, into the New York office to manage the New York office, right? 
So we had Tom Hudgens, who was retiring. Jim Turley was brought in to manage the New York office. Now, you know, we have all, lots of offices, lots of everything. So I, I come home and uh, tell my husband, Satish, you know, this is interesting. We have Jim Turley now, who's managing the New York office. And he said, where did he come from? I said, well, he, he was brought in from our Minneapolis office. He was managing the Minneapolis office. He came here. And then my husband asked me the next question, saying, when is Phil Lascaway retiring? Now, Phil Lascaway was the current chairman. When is Phil Lascaway retiring? So I don't think about it. I don't know. Maybe it's a couple of years out. And the next thing he tells me is Jim Turley has been brought in to take Phil Lascaway's job. And this, this was, didn't even happen. It was like years, two or three years later that it actually happened. So that he tells me this. And then he proceeds very quickly, say, and I, I was already a partner, right? I was a partner for a number of years. I said, I'd like you to go and meet Jim Turley and just go and meet him, introduce yourself. There's all these partners in New York office, you should go and meet him. And I'm like, you know, I don't even know him. I, my pa our paths haven't crossed. I, so it took me three or four months and he kept pressing me, you have to get on his calendar and meet him, right? And I, this is about 15, 16 years ago. So finally, I'm like, I have to do this, just check that box. And got on, his, on Jim's calendar, Jim Turley's calendar. This was way before he made chairman. And met up with him. And Jim's a great guy. Anyone that knows Jim, he's like uh, tremendous. You know, you can, you feel like, you know, he's like a friend. I didn't feel like he was, you know, whatever. Long story short, that thing 15 years ago, then every quarter, you know, Jim said, you know what, we should catch up every quarter. And so every quarter for 15 years, I was in whatever, till he retired, I was in, you know, in Jim Turley's office, and we used to talk about all kinds of things, anything. It was, there was no formal agenda. I wasn't like I was making any asks, and that was the other thing. I probably could have made asks that I never did. Uh, but, but the point is, that's what set the relationship up. And the, I think the lesson for me in that is we have to be able to get out of our thing and make connections and reach out to people that we think might not be as approachable and make that, whether it's a cup of coffee, whether it's a little connection, that has to be your, I've always said this to everybody, is like, you can be Albert Einstein and you'll fail if people don't want you to succeed. You have to have people around you, the ecosystem, that wants you to succeed. You have to have people that want you to succeed. If people don't want you to succeed, doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter, you know, what kind of brains you might have. You might be an Einstein. So the, the point is, you have to figure out how you find those connections and, and be able to, whether it's a quick, you know, invite someone over for dinner or something or coffee. That has to be a regular part of your routine because at the end of the day, people hire people who they feel like they trust and they can, or they promote people, or they pull people, or give them opportunities. They think of them. That has to be the core of a person's life, whether it doesn't even matter whether you're Asian or not, early on. And I think for us, it becomes even more important to do that, is really find those bridges. And we tend to find our bridges with other Indians or other Asians or whatever else a lot more. It's, it's easier. We have to find the non-easy route. So to me, that's sort of been the mantra. We have to be able to do that. And I suspect a lot of what I've been able to do over these years is because of being pushed, et cetera, and finding those little bridges and constantly being you know, you have 280,000 people around the world, right? And <laughs> lots to meet. I haven't met 90% of them. But the point is uh, being finding those little connections. Uh, inside, and your peer group too. The one group that you can never, never, never forget, N not only the people who work for you, is your peer group. Because the peer group, honestly, are the ones you're competing with. And, it, you know, we, we, we talk to our bosses a lot, certainly impress our bosses, but you have to have peer groups that are friends. And that is critically important uh, because you could be undermined very quickly if they're not really friend, real good friends of yours. Thank you. That's Thanks, Shada. I think that's a very valid point because there's formal structures, there's informal networks, and there's a lot that can be said about setting the tone at the top. You know, sometimes I always ask, is it a culture issue? Is it a structure issue? Is it an accessibility issue? Is it an availability issue, supply and demand of that talent? Or is it just a, an awareness issue? I do think that we all have to give really, really careful thinking around what it is that each of our organizations are facing. What do we have and how do we elevate that talent? How many of you were at the last summit, last two summits? Last summit? Last two summits? Okay, great. I learned a new term, and Maria, thank you very much. The new majority. 
And I think that was something that John was coined and phrased in the last summits that reflects the whole diversity movement and how in time, maybe in 2030, that will be the new majority. And so when we think about today, 2020, the pipeline has to be built. So whose responsibility is it? How do you see it? And maybe from your own experiences, who is responsible for making sure this pipeline is properly laid out? Karen, I see you nodding away. <laughs> I do think it's all stakeholders. I don't think it's one particular group. I think obviously within the organization as we, I cannot agree with Sharda more, you have to build bridges with the same race and then you have to build bridges with really all races and all genders and all diversity um, peers and bosses and subordinates. You have to build the, the meaningful networks and I do think, so internally I think the stakeholders really matter. I think across your client, supply chain, you know, those, you know, sort of when you think about the ecosystem, you know, I think those stakeholders obviously matter. And then I think it's very important to have enablers. I view AABDC as an enabler organization. I view Hydric Struggles as an enabler, you know, sort of talent you know, identifying organization. I think all of those enabling, enabling organizations are equally important. I mean, how you place C-suite, how you place board members, I just give a tremendous amount of visibility to the talent um, that's available in our community. And I think the more success follows success when people see that, but when the people see that level of gravitas and visibility and people automatically assume that we have a lot more to offer um, than maybe what we historically have been given credit for. And I think the stereotypical you know, functions that Asians tend to be associated with, again, this pipeline building of in other non-stereotypical functions, I think that responsibility lies on all of our shoulders. James and Kim, perhaps, perhaps you could tell us your own view around what can the individual do to own that responsibility? Because I think, you know, you don't want to go into a mode of learned helplessness. It's, we learn it from actually the other diversity groups that are ahead of us. Because the Asian Americans are probably, as Zhui would say, the lost, um, the, the lost diversity group. Um, what can the individual do to take responsibility for your own future? I think the most important thing, and, and this is a word uh, Karen used earlier, it's awareness, but it's self-awareness. I mean, I don't even need to ask everybody. You've all been in a room, you felt, uh, you felt like you didn't belong, you felt like you were placed in a role, whether that was your role or not. We've all had that experience. I think the one thing that was just like a light in my head is, like, if you, you have to use the tools you have. Use your eyes and use your ears you can see what's going on in a room, right? So in a, if you're in a company, there are written rules, right? You have your HR policies, you have your promotion criteria, but there are un, there's unwritten rules. There's, uh, there are roles that people automatically play. There's in any room, that's the mansplainer, You'll see that person that's like, always talking over a woman. There's a yes man, usually that's a man. There's the Asian person, whether East Asian, Southeast, who, who's like the quant. Even if they're not the quant, they're asked to, hey, can you, can you do the math? Uh, but, but it, and it's, these are the stereotypes, but if your eyes are open and your ears are, and ears are open, you can see it happening. Then you have a choice, right? So when we're talking about, you know, making that extra connection, networking, you know, going back against the mansplainer, or I'm not your quant, or I'm gonna speak first. Normally, I don't speak first, because, for, again, Asian stereotypes, we typically don't speak first, and we'll speak when spoken to. It's your, it's your choice. We don't, have to, we don't have to shed our cultural heritage, right? If we're, if we're brought up to be humble, brought up to be respectful, we're, it, the goal is not to act like, like a white man to succeed, right? That is not what we, like, we wouldn't succeed if we were, because. Nobody will treat us like that. But if you know what's going on around you, if you can see the, I mean, if you can see the institutional scaffolding around, then you can, then you can make a difference. So it, every situation is going to be different. But if you can see it, then you can do. You can choose what you want to do. If you have the right relationship with your leader, your boss, you can help him or her be more aware, that's how you ultimately can change. So that's, that's not specific advice on what you can do today. It's more, if you go in with your eyes open and your ears open, you really can see what's really going on. It's a, just one more thing. It's, 
it's not quite, it's a little bit like, I don't know if you saw The Matrix when Neo gets playing, he goes, <laughs> whoa. Like, and and you, you see what's going on. And, you, and then you know what you feel? I feel a little mad. Like, what the hell? Like, this is the role people expect me to be? Like, and if you're mad, you can do something about it. And, and by the way, again, Asian stereotypes, we don't want to speak up. We don't want to get, you, want, you, don't, you don't want to lead. It, it, when you look around the room, like if I'm a little bit mad and I actually, in this room, I actually feel a little more powerful, a little stronger. So if you're a little mad and you're, if you're a little more powerful, then you can do the things that are, you know, I know are hard to do. It's hard for me to do. I'm, I know it's hard for all of us to do. So that's, I mean, th that's some, I, uh, when I think about what we can do. It's true. Can do I some, some the, yeah. sorry, Sharda. Sorry, ahead, do one thing every day that scares you. I've always, I, I, I've always stolen that line from Eleanor Roosevelt. And I wake up in the morning and go, all right, what is the one thing you don't want to do or what's the one thing you fear doing? Do it. Challenge yourself. In fact, I don't, I'm not very good at moderating. And John said, you're going to moderate. I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, I'll moderate. But so here we are. Yeah. Um, James, I know you want to share something. Shut up. Sure. Um, did you? Yeah, go ahead, go, ahead, go ahead. So my advice for people who are in positions of power to recruit for leadership positions, you know, it goes back to what Karen was saying earlier. It's about mentorship, but also sponsorship, right? Uh, mentorship is about actively working with uh, Asian Americans in your organizations, especially those who are earlier on your career, to role model for them, right? To show them a career path and, you know, to inspire them. I think that's very important. But that in itself is not going to be sufficient. You have to take the extra step of sponsorship. And the difference between sponsorship and mentorship is sponsorship, you're actively going out there, you're putting maybe, you're taking some risks, you're putting your, your own reputation in the line to go out there and say, hey, you know, I believe in so-and-so, I wanna give this person an opportunity, right, to rise through the ranks, and I'm going to personally work with this person to nurture him or her to ensure that this person is successful. I think there isn't enough of that going around today, and I think it's very important. Now on the flip side, my advice to individuals who are looking to you know, break through the ranks, this is how I think about things myself. There are, there are certain things for me that are non-negotiables. Part of it is uh, maybe my culture, my heritage, the way I think about things, you know, my moral compass, et cetera, that no matter what the situation is, I'm just unwilling to break those things and change. But then there are things that I see as an adaptability topic, right? The way you communicate with others, the way you position yourself, the way you manage confrontation, these are things that can be learned. Right? And sometimes I hear in corporations where people say, hey, you know, that goes against my culture, you know, I'm Asian, I can't do that. Well, it's only partially true, right? There are certain things as an Asian you need not change and you should really work to your strength. But then there are other things that have nothing to do about being an Asian, they're just skills that we pick up along the way. And my advice to especially the younger generation is to think about what those adaptability topics are and how you can shape and morph yourself to become more effective leaders. Absolutely, that whole balance that Raj referred to earlier about being modest and at the same time being confident. So, Sharda, I know you want, you want to share on that one. I just wanted to pick up on something that, that Kim said earlier. Um, again, you know, I asked my husband one time, saying, what would you have done differently in your career that you, uh, if you had to sort of reel it back again, and what would you have done differently? And he said something that I can sort of, it's so, so true. He said, you know, I would have spent more time after work. I mean, he was a, a he's a trader in, you know, the only brown man in, in, a, in a trade, on a trading floor. This is a long time ago. And he said, I would have spent more time after work when folks used to ask me, you know what, let's just go out for a, beer or whatever else, and I always chose to go home, right? I always chose to go home, and I rarely ever went and hung out with the boys, um, you know, after work. And he said, you know, what ha really happens is the, you find out about what really goes on, and it's like the context, and you know, wh who, who knows who, and what's really going on. You know, when you're in, at nine to five, you're so busy with work and everything else, none of that stuff is transparent. You have no idea. 
and and when you are you know in a setting where people are a lot you know feel a lot more open and they share things share things that are you know personal or going through their mind in that post um, post a day sort of over a beer or whatever else, coffee wine whatever else it is um, you learn a lot more at that in that time that gives you a lot more context about what you what you really you to understand the you to have your antennas up about what's really going on, understand politics a lot better, understand people a lot better, and then are those, and then it very well could be, you know, something comes up and that person you were in the, in the bar with that you just had a beer that got to know you that was on a different floor might have an opening that gives you a break on something that you might never have gotten a break on. You know, just, just something, because you, you were visible, you were there. So, I mean, to me, it's sort of, again, it's about connecting with people and being able to be, you know, find that extra time to, to get to know yeah. them, because all human beings, I, you know, have the best of intent. There's Absolutely. just no one that doesn't. It's just a matter of getting to know people and also opening yourself up. I think I just found early on in my life, I had a big shield. I wouldn't talk about things that were important to me. Most people, you know, didn't even know what Diwali was, and I never, you know, went even so it was sort of a big quiet nothing, right, for the first 25 years at EY, because I didn't even talk about it. It was a big thing for us, but we never talked about it and, and, and at work. But and so it was a big thing that I'd, I'd set up, and artificial, and once people got to know, well, you know, tomorrow's Diwali, this is a big thing here. You know, I used to get start getting notes from people, Americans, I mean, hey, happy Diwali, and this That's and that. So it, it's just opening yourself up also, and being able to be, to share, stuff that, that, you know, that, that you might otherwise not share, so. And, and I a, think to wrap that one up, I, I think you're absolutely right. Every one of our panelists have said things that I think as Asian Americans, never mind, this is the Asian mother coming out from me, I think we will have such a major issue with control. We wanna make sure everything gets done exactly the way we envision it. So in the organization context, well, go out with the boys, okay, Maybe I won't say anything, maybe I will. And then when you come in the next day, what can I say, what can't I say? So I think there are a few points here. Awareness and adaptability, which you brought up. I think you talk about the willingness to be vulnerable. I think the vulnerability piece, I'm still learning it. Because the control person in me will never want to show everything. I think it goes with success and confidence. It comes with experience. And it comes with really all of us, I bet, are subject matter, subject matter experts. And as we go into the world, we need to broaden that subject matter expertise into something that goes up on the leadership scale, goes up on the communication capability, and broadening your network. Over dinner last night, we talked about something which I would love to share because I think some of us felt, oh my gosh, it, to me, it was a no-brainer because it happened to me, but I was fortunate enough to have a great sponsor and a mentor in our chairman when I first came from Singapore. Really green, you know, just so green, really fresh face, and he's the one who says, stop talking so fast. But he also was a great um, role model for me to look up at what really made him so successful. He was named... Um, he was named Recruiter of the Century. His name is Jerry Roach, bless his soul. But he did one thing for me, a few things, but one is always be the best at what you do. But here's the one thing that I learned and realized that as an Asian, and maybe just as a woman executive, that I really appreciate. He's, he's such a sociable person, very appropriately sociable. But a lot of the times when we walk into the room for a major meeting, his first instinct was to connect with that next person. And what did they talk about? Nothing about the business of the business. It was all around, who are you? You know, where where did you go to school? Who are you connected with? Where do you golf? What do you love to do? Where did you get your vacation? All the things that are life experiences. So the, the, the fact is, I think we're also wrapped up in trying to be great at what we do, we don't give enough time. It's like a muscle that you kind of want to exercise. You know, you've got great muscles on one hand. Let's exercise this muscle. Let's kind of make sure we give enough time to balance ourselves and be total people, real people, people that 
other than Asian Americans can connect with and we can connect with them. Because at the end of the day, we're all just human beings. And sometimes being Asian American may get in the way of that because we see ourselves as that and we forget we're just another human being. So that's my one little thing. Karen, I know that you were nodding away, so did you want to share on that point? I think something dawned on me as I was listening to all of you and actually thought it was quite interesting to talk about this. And I bet all of you have felt that way. You wanted to succeed, you wanted to be recognized and you, in your respective careers. You probably want to say, I'm really good at that, right? I'm the best at what I can be in doing this. And don't, don't give it to me because I'm, I can talk now from my own personal experience. Don't promote me because I'm a woman. Don't promote me because I'm Asian American. Don't promote me because, uh, because I'm, I can check three boxes in your DNI form or something like that. And don't promote me because whatever, it makes you look good. Promote me because I am that good. Promote me because I know my, I know my stuff. And you know, I can deliver value. So we wanted them to be gender blind and race blind. And we wanted them to be like objective. And we almost wanted that because of our pride, our, our educational background, our ego, or whatever, our values and ethics, and we are that good. Let me be promoted for my own merits, not because of all these other labels. I hated labels. I hated labels like, oh, you're Chinese, you're American, you went to Japan, and you're a Japan, or Jap you know, whatever, Japanese, Chinese, you went to England, and you have all these labels, and you're a woman, and you're a trader, or you're this and that. I hated labels. Just promote me because I'm good. So we wanted them to be gender race blind. We almost wanted them to be like non-DNI sensitive. But now we're sort of talking the the reverse, we're saying embrace this. And I actually think that, I think this, the decade, now it's a new decade and it's a new, not just a new year, it's a new decade and a new century and all that stuff. Like, I actually believe people should embrace that indi individuality, the diversity, we should embrace, we should be very proud of the fact that we are Asians and we're women and we're whatever that we are and the sexual pre you know, preferences and many different axes that now is called this diversity fabric. And we have to embrace that. So we go from being blind and objective and all that stuff to now actually using that to our advantage. Absolutely. And you know, I, you know, this is a very personal fact that my, my, uh, my parents who are college professors and my brother, you know, I'm the black sheep, my brother is a college professor in the States and he's, he is gay. Right, he doesn't really want to come out, and he obviously come out like gradually to family and part of his close friends, and but he's still not embracing his individuality. And I'm very proud of the fact he is a gay professor yeah. in one of the toughest subjects at American University. And I, I used to joke with him. I say, if you told the faculty that you are gay, you probably would have earned tenure three years <laughs> faster. <laughs> And he was like, no, I, I'm gonna earn this on my own merit and I'm gonna do this. And I'm so proud of him. Of course, he still made it when he was super young. Yeah. But you know, that's the Absolutely. fact that I still think a lot of us don't embrace that. We are not proud of all these labels and maybe now it's you know, time to turn it on its head right. and actually embrace that and using that to our advantage and actually really helping our fellow Americans, Asian Americans or Asians achieve that. Because I think, you know, a lot of, for so many years, I think I wanted people to be blind about the, the labels, and now actually I'm very proud of it. Yeah, well spoken, well spoken, and great points. I would love to open this up. I see the five minute signal, so we have room for a few questions. Please, I'd love to open this up to the audience. Yes, uh, thank you for the conversation. So it's great to see uh, Asians, Americans are represented pretty well in finance and tech, but I'm curious to ask you, what about places where we're underrepresented, like uh, Capitol Hill or law enforcement or sp sports leagues or even certain places where I feel that we can improve on it? Can we have a discussion on that for the start before we look at our achievements as well? I was hoping that someone on the panel would volunteer for that. I think Kim will do it. So Capitol Hill, I think, I mean, politics, maybe you think about that more broadly because 
because my wife is, is running for office, so I've thought about this a lot. So one thing, one, thing you've, one thing you've seen in the latest Democratic debates is two debates ago, there were three Asian Americans on stage, right? And the next one, there will be zero. So they're close, but there's still this bamboo ceiling. But there's, right, there's one of each. Or, you know, there's one, maybe two of each in the population. There aren't enough. So the, the way, long term, ultimately, is to encourage people to get involved. So we've talked about getting involved uh, in ERGs, supporting each other. It's also getting involved in your community, supporting your community. Part of that is ultimately getting involved in community organizations, being activists, being in politics. If you, you, know, you, if you get on the ground level now, a generation later, and it's going to be a generation later, I hope it's not, but it will be at least decades later before that's, that's the rising group. That's not a different issue than the, the, the corporate issue we have. Lots of people in the bottom of the triangle, very few uh, at the top. Here, there's nobody at the bottom of the triangle. So I think that those are the kind of things we, we need to focus on and encourage and help and donate and raise money and support. Thank you, Kim. I think it's an acceptance issue. I think socially, we might be behind because a lot of our struggles are all related to performance and rewards. You know, I think that if we broaden our, our scope and our uh, mindset and help others in the firm or in the organization do that and the acceptance level is there, then maybe we'll have more people elect to do that. I have room for one or two more questions. I know I'm, I'm standing between you and the, and the drinks and Michael Chan, so. Hi, um, I'm a member of the Asian American Journalists Association. I've been covering diversity for many, many years. And uh, it's a segue from what you're saying and this gentleman said. Over the years, I've wondered uh, or felt that to, for Asian Americans to advance, we have to advance in entertainment, in political office, social media now, own the means of production, fight racism at all levels so diversity is accepted. But of all of these, I found over the years, I felt for Americans, since so many Americans get their information from entertainment, that entertainment and social media is really critically important. How do you feel about investing in movies and Netflix and uh, programs and entertainment that uh, emphasize and promote Asian Americans you know, beyond Aquafina? <laughs> if, if any of you would like to respond, otherwise I'll jump right in just in the interest of time. I've had the great fortune of um, working on a very important board search for, I'll, I'll say it, and please keep this with discretion, Burberry. They wanted us at Burberry to bring in a cultural bent because they were going from luxury um, heritage to luxury contemporary. So it's streetwear. And with streetwear comes the, the need to really know what goes on at street level. And in the process of doing that, I met so many diversity candidates. And the ones that I met were in the media and entertainment world. And our placement was, at the end of the day, CEO or the retired CEO of Black, Black Entertainment TV, uh, Debbie Lee. But here's what I learned. There's definitely a great movement at Netflix, at all the, all the media companies, one content. And what I'm hearing the producers do and how they're thinking about it is content as in, from a diversity standpoint, they are going to create programs and films that really relate right across the board, even though they're very ethnically driven. So Fresh Off the Boat, for example. It's so relatable. Or Black Panther, it's, you know, the heroes, etc. It's so relatable even to a total broader American audience. Crazy Rich Asians, you know, I related to that because I'm from Singapore, but they have all these concepts. I mean, you put crazy radiations. A girlfriend and I were talking, she is really dating someone who is a very accomplished investment banker, you know, Jewish descent, but very New York, and you get, you get a picture. I hate stereotyping. But she's like, oh my gosh, you know, those, that's like West Palm Beach and New York. And the, the, the important thing to know is it doesn't matter. It almost is an advantage, as Karen would say, that we have a class of our own. But whatever we do, we need to make it relatable on a broader level. So I would say the media and entertainment world is coming right around that. Um, they've done it with a lot of African-American um, series. 
and now they've gone right through to Asian Americans. Um, the Latina, they, well, you know, they have their own media mm -hmm. channels. So I hope that is a little bit of a response, not quite on point. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add to what you said. I think media and inter entertainment industry at the end of the day, it's still a, you know, for-profit industry, right? And what really drives the taste of media and entertainment, and I'm, I'm by no means an expert on this, right? It's about viewership, right? They, they will invest in the genres or the, the type of casting that will earn them the big bucks in the box office. And you know, I, I feel pretty optimistic about how things are progressing, uh, you know, coinciding with the rise of China and all the consumerism in the Chinese market being you know, one of the largest uh, entertainment industries outside of North America, you can see more and more film studios, especially you, you look at Legendary uh, Pictures, which is owned by Wanda Group, placing very key roles of, you know, international movies that are starred by, you know, ch you know Asian actors and actresses, right? And I don't think they're, they're doing that for the, out of the goodness of their hearts. They're doing that because they can drive viewership in the mainland China market, right? So as long as we continue to, to go out and support the media entertainment industry with our wallets, right, and speak with our wallets, we will start to see more changes. And I think you touched upon the financing aspect of it. So obviously from an ESG financing standpoint, just like now we focus on more SME financing with women entrepreneurs. When you look at ESG angle for media and entertainment, whether it's looking at film you know, warehouse lines, whether it's mm -hmm. looking at securitization, ABS, a lot of that actually is emphasis has been given on the different filters you can apply, whether it's talent, whether it's directorship, whether it's actually you know, sort of addressable markets. I do think those financing will receive its rightful market share, if you will, um, with the right ESG angle and actually penetrating Asian markets. Yeah. I think we're really flat out of time, Mike. Over to you. Thank you, everyone. Please give a hand to the panelists. Thank you.